Okay guys, today I'm down at Mike's Shock Shop. I've got Mike here next to me. Now Mike is my go-to man when it comes to anything shocks. He sorted me out with my Kings and he's the man that does all my servicing, tuning and all that kind of stuff. So basically I've come down, I'm in the sunshine state of Queensland, so I thought why not come in and see Mike and give us a bit more detail of what goes on in these shock absorbers. Because a lot of people put them on their vehicles and just leave them be. But there's a lot of detail that can be learned with this kind of stuff when, and you can set them up to suit your vehicle properly. So um, I think we'll go through basically what's inside the shock absorber, how they work, what you want to look out for for servicing and stuff like that, and then also some common questions and misconceptions that are out there when it comes to shock absorbers. Okay, so we've got the 2.5 shock here, so this is pretty much what I'm running in my patrol. So, what's inside this thing? So this is a, is a, is a, is a more of a linear shock absorber. It doesn't have a lot of internal bleed. It, it does have bleed on the um, reservoir, yep. but it, it doesn't have um, internal bleed like an internal bypass or an external bypass. So this is the assembly. So that's out of the it. center of what, what's Correct. in it. Correct. Okay. Exactly what's inside. So when the shock goes up and down, what actually moves in there? So pretty much, this is all at the very. This is attached to the cylinder. So this is your seal seal carrier or your seal housing and this is your wiper, your wiper cap. This is the part of the shock absorber that's responsible for all of the control. Okay. So your, your top row of shims here on top of the piston, that controls your rebound stroke. So that's as yep. the tyre the and wheel fall out of the car. And then on the underside is your compression um, stack or you need the shims for your compression stroke and that controls the, the, okay. the shock absorber as the, the wheels. So the, so the compression and rebound are basically separate sort of Complete, components completely. so you can tune the way it comes up and then the way it comes yeah, down. Yeah, yep. and I mean, and, and you know, all, all a shock's primary function is is to control the forces that the spring's producing. Yep. What do we got? What do we got next to it here? What is this? So this is a King internal bypass. This is a 2.5 IBP. So um, IBP stands for internal, internal bypass. bypass. Okay. Um, there is a lot of companies with internal bypass technology. Yep. Um, this one in particular has um, got a patent. It's very different, being it's um, it's a mono tube design, so it still holds the same external design as a, as a normal shock. Yeah. It's just got a needle in the top, and if you have a show the camera the front of the piston there. It's got a hollow shaft, um, obviously to a certain degree, and then a needle comes in and engages, and it engages both of these pistons at the same time, okay. and doesn't allow any oil to bleed past the shims. Now, are these fairly new on the market, or have they been around for a while? Well, or? King have been doing it, I'd hate to get it wrong, but I'd say probably the, at least seven or eight years, I'd yep. say they started playing with the IBP stuff. I've actually got an, mm. an IBP needle here, Chris can okay. pass through and show us. And as you can see, as that goes up through the stroke, yep. that pin engages until it's all the way in, and then you've got, you know, full full valving. It's it's all every shim in the shock mm. is restricting what it can do yep. in terms of whatever stroke it's on. So these aren't really big in sort of street cars at the moment, are eh? they? Mm. Still coming into the market. Do you think this is sort of the future of suspension when it comes to tourers and stuff like that? Look, it, it's, you know, you got companies like ARB and Fox that are already um, doing, they're doing things with um, different designs. They have yep. a, like a more of a twin tube design. So it'd be a, it'd be a similar setup to what you'd see in here. Yeah. Everything would be a fair bit smaller, I dare say. Yep. And they have another, they have a, another tube. So the tube's actually got holes drilled and it allows it to bleed. Okay. Around the inner tube. Yeah, yeah. So Kings is the only mono tube one um, that I know of. I'm pretty confident there might be some motorcycle brands that have a similar okay. design. Cool. Um, but Kings the only mono tube IBP. They definitely work. Yep. Really, really well. All right. Um, we'll get into the nitty gritty. You've basically laid out here what's assembled in this unit. Is that yeah, right? Yeah, pretty much. All this right. is a 2.5. This is a 3.0. Okay. You'll hear people talking about. 2.0, 2.5, 3.0, and so on. Yep. It's all just in the piston diameter. Yep. So, you know, as you can see, 2.5 and, and 3.0, it's not much of a difference, mm. but when you're looking at the actual surface area, yeah. it's huge. Yep. So, uh, I know a 2.0 and a 2.5, there's about 33% difference. Okay. So, each of these rows are laid out. What are their jobs, basically? Okay. So, in the IBP, in the IBP, I mean, well, in a, in a standard shock absorber, you just, so if we look at, you know, this and okay. that only, yep. 
Um, you'd have your rebound shims and you've got your compression shims and this is your piston. Um, that's the standard, that's what's on generic King, Fox, yep. Icon. That you've got your piston and you've got your two sets of shims. So this is probably a 15 or an 18 thou shim. It's got a lot of restriction. Yep. So if you feel that there, you, you'll see that's quite tough. And then... So for the people that don't know, what's... What's this flowing inside a shop? Is it oil? Is it gas? Is it right? So hydraulic fluids, oil. Yep. Um, you know, some guys call it shock oil, shock fluid. It's just oil. Okay. Um, and, and these shims. These shims restrict the oil. What happens to them when the shock comes up and down? Right. So if you if you have a look at this piston here, or if you have a look at that piston here, here, here is it disassembled or on its own? All that you'd. I guess the easiest way to explain it is, as you can see, they go up in size. So they'll start off as a 0.10 or a 0.09 and they'll go yep. up and they'll actually cover, see how they're covering most of the piston? Yeah. What you it'll do it is, too, and you can see it on this yeah. one, it'll res it restricts the oil in both directions. Yeah. So obviously you've got a lot of different thickness of shim. So you've got 20 thou of an inch, 18 thou, yep. 15 thou, 12, 10, 8. So they bend as oil flows Cor through. Correct, correct. So you, the, 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 the thicker the shim, the harder it is to flex. Yep. You hear people often talking about a thing called a flutter stack. Yep. And you know, you get a lot of people saying, oh, well, you know, you've got to buy shocks with a flutter stack. All a flutter stack is, is it just a different way of stacking the shims? Yep. Quick example of it is, you might, you might have, your shims generally go down in size. So you'll start off at the biggest, you might double up on a couple. You might sometimes even throw a bigger one in there if you're trying something super fancy. But all a flutter stack is, is the inclusion of a small shim. Generally we use an 8 thou, 10 thou, 12 thou. Generally if you go too thick, if you go too thick, mm. it can set too much preload obviously, so you can feel that one's pretty th thin. Yep. You get a thicker one, it actually increases the gap between the two two shims. Yep. You can actually crack shims okay. if you start using, you know, something that's so a bit too heavy. So then what's the benefit heavy. of putting that flutter stack in as per? So, comfort. Okay. What it does is, and you'll be able to see it here just, but it actually separates the... It separates... There's a small gap in there, yeah, yeah. It separates the shims. Yeah. And it just allows a bit more Helps free it flow. It's, it almost yeah. gives a plush feeling. Yeah. It doesn't make it as erratic. All right, so well, that's sort of um, the compression and rebound stacks. Now, if so, for example, if someone wanted more compression on their mm -hmm. shot, they've got a heavy vehicle hitting mm -hmm. stuff hard, what would you do shim stack wise to go in that direction? Generally, so example for, for your car, for instance, yep. you know, a standard Nissan Patrol that we send out got a normally a, a compression stack that comp compiles of let's talk front you've got a v8 they they in standard come as a as a different car you're driving yeah. a bit harder yeah. so um you know in terms of a standard car you might have eight and, uh, a compression stack on the front shock that comprise of eight thousand ten thousand shims we normally have a look at the bleed hole configuration on the piston which you'll see here this one comp compiles three it's got three different bleed holes and you can unscrew and screw them in and that can also help with the valving. It does affect the rebound stroke more. Yep. But generally, for instance, Sam sends his shocks in. It's too soft, Mike, it's bottoming out. We normally have, we assess what's inside it. We work out, you know, is it is it blowing through? Is there any adjustment left on the compression adjuster, which we'll touch base on afterwards. Yep. Um, and we try to we try to increase the, the valving enough to give you the desired result without making it jaw and jaw breaking yeah. and teeth chattering. Yep, yep. Okay, so basically we looked at that bottom end of the shock, so now we're looking at the other end, aren't we? So yeah, this so... this is where the, the resi is and where the actual shaft goes yeah, into. Yeah, yeah. So we didn't see before, but this is just the cylinder of that assembly. Yep. So it's just where the shaft goes into. Um, pretty much all the same. It's just relative to the size of the body yep. um, and the size of the piston that it takes, and there you've got your size. You'll see two other um, two other things coming off most of our shock absorbers, and they generally a remote reservoir, or a piggyback reservoir. They'll either be billet mounted onto the top here, yep. or they'll be hosed like this one. We have a few different types of reservoirs. We've got a standard smooth body reservoir. There's nothing inside it except this floating piston. And what that does is it separates the oil and the nitrogen. 
that wear band sits on there and it just travels up and down here. So you're saying nitrogen? Yes. Do all shocks have nitrogen in them? No, or, okay. no. So, so most of the high end shocks will separate your gases and your oil. Yep. It stops aeration. Yep. And that's all it does here. So there's no actually, there's no actually oil in the reservoir. It's the oil finishes here. Okay. on the floating piston so you'll have a you'll have all this hose will still be full of oil and the only oil that actually goes in here is the oil that's displaced by the size of the shaft okay. as it goes up so that piston might end up about here at full bump so what's the advantage of having this just cooling, the basic cooling, cooling yeah. more surface area better heat dissipation yep. it can fit more oil in the shock it stops aeration it's just a much better design um, next option with the same reservoir is to add the adjuster the compression adjuster. Um, this is a fully dismantled compression adjuster here off this shock. And as you can see, you've got those same shims you saw on the, on the, on the main shaft assembly. Yep. Um, and what this adjuster does is it's a true one-way adjuster that's affected by shaft speed. Um, this knob, red knob here, like on this one, is attached up here. It just screws in a valve and allows oil to either, when it's fully open, it bypasses the shims both ways. Yep. And when it's closed somewhat or, or all the way, it'll start to force oil through these shims. And those okay. shims are also interchangeable to make your compression adjuster more aggressive. Yeah, okay. So what sort of situations would you want that kind of characteristic of a shock? Yeah, I'm big on road going four wheel drives, especially tourers yep. Yep. And, and guys who do like work, work with it during the week, tow a trailer and then might throw a swag and an esky on the weekend. Yeah. What it allows us to do, because they're such big shock absorbers, they generate a lot of force pretty easily. Yeah. So we can, on the main piston, we can valve the compression quite soft. And it allows for when you're unloaded or you're just cruising, going really slow to have that nice, comfortable, you know, feeling. Yeah. And then if you want to step it up a bit, get, you know, give it some berries, crank that up depending on the shims inside it will depend on, and, and the shaft speed will depend on how much more compression it gives you. Um, but it, they're, they're, they're a really, really trick item and I recommend them on anything that's more than a one, like does more than one thing. Yeah. Then we've got the Finres option. Um, yeah. Exactly the same thing in terms of function. It all comes down to cooling. This yeah. is a pretty um, expensive option. Yeah. Um, it's awesome. Like you're talking 40 degrees centigrade difference, difference. Okay. In, in, at well, peak yeah. operating temperatures. Okay, so we've pretty much covered everything inside of shock, how they work, the resis, all that kind of stuff. Now, I wanted to step it up. He's got some cool stuff in the shop here. So this bypass shock, see them on a lot of race trucks. It's sort of, you start getting into the real hardcore stuff here, but I wanted him to take us through basically what the idea behind these are and, and why a lot of these race trucks run them. So what's going on inside a bypass shock? So mate, pretty much like, except from the cylinder and the parts that are required um, in these tubes that you see external to the cylinder, um, the shock's the same. Yep. So same piston, same seal carrier, same exact same design. Yep. All it does is, is it allows essentially to have a bunch of different zones. So as you saw in the IBP, had bleed off zone, then it had a, almost an internal bump zone or a, or a two stage shock absorber. Yep. Well these, these can come in two tube, three tube, four tube, five tube, all the way to seven tube. As, yep. as, as well, there's a seven here. I want to bring it in. Yeah. Just to yeah. blow your mind. I saw this thing and I was like, holy shit. It's been around the country a few times, so. But, oh my God. It's the size of me. I don't know if that'll fit in the camera there. Maybe it'll come in this one, but. The way that these tubes work, as you can see, they don't go the whole way up the, the shock absorber. So you've got a compression tube that goes to here, which then stops, and then there's another compression tube here. So essentially you can make it progressively stiffer. Okay. Up here, you can see you've got no bleed. So all of the shimming, on the piston is subject to going through that oil. So that's what yeah. you call the bump zone. Yeah. Um, once you get out here, this is the this is the ride zone or, or where, where it's all doing most of the work. Um, here we've got a, a bypass assembly. This is a rebound bypass valve. It comes in a few different pieces. This one's got two bleed holes on it. You can get one, none, two or three. Is this is all comes down to fine tuning. Mm. This spring here, we actually have different spring rates, harder spring rates to make it harder for the oil to push this valve back. The stiffer the spring, the more force you need to 
for that to go back there. So is it just a volume of oil basically pushing against that? Yes, correct. So, this, so as, as is as, the length of this tube obviously critical as well because that's how much oil it'll uh, that run into uh, here. A hundred percent. So the, the diameter of the tubes yep. um, very very important. As you'd see on that big shock, the tubes are, are much bigger than this. Yep. Um, more bigger tube, more oil flow. The way it works is as the shock as the shock extends, it'll allow as it's pushing sucking that oil down, it'll allow. The, the piston to come out, and we'll show you later on, it actually will free up when it gets to this port, depending on how far this screw, this screw's the adjuster. Yep. So you crack that nut and you screw that in and out. The further you screw that in, the less distance that the spring in the valve can travel. Yep. So these things are so cool in terms of what you can make a car do mm, with a yeah. few turns of these tubes. Um, there's a lot of adjustment in them, as you can see. But so in simple terms, basically it's that lower end of the shock you can tune soft. Yes, and then correct. As it comes up, it gets harder, stiffer Co and stiffer. Correct. So it, it, essentially, if you could imagine, bang, 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 soft, stiffer, stiff. Um, and then, you know, one rebound tube isn't really enough for a race car, but any road-going vehicle, perfect. It'll allow it to, to be nice and free and won't throw you around, but you can tighten it up. Yep. Um, <clears throat> now. Most guys don't put these on their road cars. Yeah. Uh, they definitely are not a necessity for mum and dads or, yeah. or anything like that. Can't but imagine. There it's... is a, a small percentage of people that do retrofit these to their vehicles. Yeah. Generally in the smaller size, in the 2.5, but yeah. we make the same product. Yeah, yeah, okay, amazing. All right, we're gonna do a bit of a simulation here. With this triple bypass, we can basically show what the adjustment does. So on the rebound stroke here, we can pump some gas into it and simulate that rebound stroke. At the moment, it's fully wide open, so you'll see the start of the stroke fairly slow. Once it gets into that inner tube there, it will open right up and then slow down again at the top. So we just want to run that now. So that's pretty much your bump zone. And then it's speeding up in that that ride zone there and then opening up fully. Now we'll bring it back down and basically change this adjustment here, wind it in and show the difference of what that can do. All right, now that rebound adjust has been wound all the way in, so it should go a bit slower. Run it now and we'll see what happens. So it's still with that bump zone there and then it comes into that next adjustment. There we go, it's just hit over there and it's gone up much slower than it did before. So that just goes to show how much sort of play you've got with these bypass shocks so you can tune it. So for the vehicle, for the terrain, even if you've got one set up, depending on what track you're on, you can actually sort of make those tweaks on the fly because it's external to suit the conditions you're in. So I think now we've sort of had a look at the detail of all these shocks. Mike's run through what goes on inside them with the shimming, with, with the different uses, with the external reservoirs and that. I think we'll go into a bit of a Q&A sort of section where we can talk about servicing, when it's required, why it's required, and some common questions and misconceptions. All right, so basically from the end, on the back end of this, I just wanna go through some common questions that people will normally have about shocks. And I wanna start things off with servicing because it's not something that's really common with shock absorbers. A lot of guys just buy them as is. Don't worry about valving them, just put them in their car and run them into the ground. So first question is basically, when should you service your shocks and then what do you do when you service them? Yep, so um, servicing your shocks will depend, like the time will depend on the brand, the size um, and the application. Yep. Um, just for, if we just touch base on like road going vehicles, um, you know, your, your, your 2.0 stuff, so your, your, your Pro Fender, your Foxes, your, anything rebuildable um, in a small diameter, I, I'd, I'd really recommend probably every 50 or so thousand Ks, um, they'll yeah. need a, they'll need an oil and, a, and then possibly a seal change. Yep. You um, mentioned rebuildable. How mm -hmm. can people know whether their shock's rebuildable or not? Is that just look, the fact that the caps can come yeah, off? Yeah, look, 90% no, of shocks on the market are not rebuildable. Yep. Um, most of the shocks that claim to be rebuildable are not fully rebuildable. Yep. In terms of fully rebuildable shocks, uh, you're really limited to your high-end Bilsteins, um, your Kings, your Foxes, your Icons, your Radflows, your ADS, and you know your shock absorbers that I guess have a racing heritage yep. generally have a, a, a road variant or a consumer variant that is still fully serviceable. So I guess in terms of what happens when you service them, a standard service is just oil or hyd your hydraulic fluid, your seals, um, floating piston wear band, 
um, and your bearings, um, and then your labour portion. You might um, you might change a, a wear band on your actual main piston. That's not necessarily happening every service, yep. but every standard service is oil, full seal kit, and a full clean. Okay. Um, often you'll find there'll be shaft damage. Yeah. Um, if that is the case, we'll have to replace the shaft because a, a seal will get torn. Yeah, if the shaft's damaged, is that sort of the oil can start passing through? Yeah, then, yeah, it? like if a shaft's damaged, it'll normally nick the seal or tear the seal and you'll start to get a weep around yeah. the shaft and down the shaft. Um, it generally happens, it, it happens to everyone who doesn't use shaft protection in Australia. Yeah. That's another thing I wanted to get into is sort of the shaft protection. A lot of these ones, they look so nice with the shaft yeah. coming out, but yeah. it's very important actually protect that as well, especially on the back back of the vehicle. Yeah, unfortunately, like, especially being in Australia, um, the, 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 the roost guards that come on the shocks from the factory aren't really sufficient. Yeah, so okay. for warranty purposes and longevity of shocks, we really recommend rubber boots. Yeah. Take some of the impact. I know it doesn't look real great, but it's, it's, it's a cheap insurance policy. Yeah. Because at the end of the day, if you have that exposed shaft, sand, fine grit, rock, yeah anything, it's gonna smash into it. It's just gonna hit it, it's gonna, it, yeah, it's gonna yeah. pit it. And I mean, we can polish shafts mm. and, and make them better, but once they start getting damaged, you start changing seal mm. kits a lot. It's better, you're better off just spending the extra 150 or $200 yeah. and changing it. So for those guys that do want you know, the shock seal exposed because of the way they look. Is there another option that protects that shaft other than a boot? Look, Fox, Old Man Emu, King, um, they've all got a, a roost guard option. Okay. Um, that roost guard, it, it does work. Does it work enough to, to satisfy warranty needs? I, I, I'm, we won't warrant a shock absorber unless it's got a rubber boot. Yeah. I know they don't look the most it's, beautiful It's not thing. a full coverage, I guess, it's so not. it's not going to do a job a boot would. And the, and the problem is, is we, we have some pretty harsh conditions in our country. Yeah. Doesn't matter what brand, um, it's a it's a plastic style mm. roof scar. A big enough rock is going to make a mess of it. Next sort of question I want to ask you is um, shock absorbers and springs. They work hand in hand, don't they? A yeah. lot of people don't realise that. Mm -hmm. So I guess um, back in the olden days, or olden days to you and me, yeah. Um, everybody, you know, the, the shock the technology in shock absorbers wasn't readily available to all consumers. Like, don't get me wrong, they've been making beautiful shocks for 40 years, but yeah. not for your everyday punter. So like you said, spring rates are really important. Um, they go hand in hand with the shock. Back in the day, a lot of people just used heavier springs to compensate for a cheaply designed shock absorber. Yep. Um, and hence the reason you, you, you'll hear around any campfire, around any any workshop yarn, someone will have a car that's rough on little bumps. Yeah. And it, and it comes down to the fine tuning in the shock absorber, but more often than not, it's, they've got a, an oversprung vehicle. So I think it's essential to make sure you have the right spring rate on your yeah. car and allow the shock to do its job. The spring's only job is to hold the car at right height yeah. and return it there. Yeah. And the shock absorber's job is to control the forces that the spring's creating. Yeah. All right guys, well that pretty much rounds out the sort of questions at the end there. Um, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe. Make sure you jump onto Mike Shock Shop's Instagram page. They're also on Facebook and you have a website up. www.mikeshocks.com So please, thumbs up and I'll see you guys in the next video. Take it easy. I've just spent three months doing engine upgrades on my motor here and I've been told I'm not allowed to turn the key until you press subscribe. Please press subscribe.